Hello, and thank you for joining us for the fifth installment of the Field Story series. Uh, we're here today with Dr. Julie Labarkin, who is a professor of Earth Sciences and director of Geocognition Laboratory at the Michigan State University. She's also an affiliate of the Center for Integrative Studies and Science and the Create for STEM Institute for Research on Science and Mathematics Education. Uh, she's also affiliated with the MSU's Cognitive Science Program and Environmental Science and Policy Program. And on top of that, Dr. Labarkin has been a long-standing advocate in science. She's also the creator of the Academic Sexual Harassment uh, Misconduct Database, which is a public searchable archive of sexual harassment cases in academia. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, Dr. Uh, first, maybe you can give us a little bit of background on the database, um, how long, you know, when it started and what kind of uh, motivated you to create uh, such an initiative. Sure. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be able to have a chat with you. Um, doesn't get to happen very often, especially now, right? So, yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. We're all in our houses. Um, so, right. So I started the database. So I, like many women in academia in male dominated spaces have experienced almost every form of sexual harassment that you can imagine. And so um, I have read articles over the years about cases of sexual misconduct perpetrated by faculty and staff and administrators. And usually those articles say, oh, it's an unusual case. And I just knew that that wasn't true. So the final straw was someone um, uh, at University of Chicago, I don't need to say their name, who was found to have engaged in sexual misconduct. And this was a person who moved from multiple other universities. There isn't any evidence that they engaged in sexual misconduct in those spaces, but the suggestion is that they probably did, and that's and the movements happened because of that, right? So there was a newspaper article that talked about that. And again, the reporters were saying, this is so unusual, and it, it, it's rare. Well, no, it's not. So um, I decided to just look, and in a day, I had 30 cases. Wow, yeah, absolutely. This idea that it's like a rare thing, and then um, the, the sort of... Um, ways in which that is a myth that upholds and protects, right? That this is, this is a outlier case or that this is a rare case. The pushback, because I imagine right. folks, some folks might not be happy about this database being public. Um, so that's an interesting thing. So I'll, first I'll tell you the good thing. So I've had a number of people reach out to say that they felt incredibly alone and just knowing, because the database is only evidenced cases and it's an aggregator of secondary of primary sources so i'm not posting rumor in any way i'm not making any claims in any way simply reproducing what's in the the public domain as it is and that's an important liability thing so but i've had a lot of people because all mm -hmm. of those cases are there in one place i've had a right. number of people reach out to thank me because they felt so alone and um, this made them feel less alone. And, and I can tell you, um, I was um, assaulted by an emeritus professor in my department, and I couldn't speak about it for years. Yeah. Um, and then when I could speak about it, I felt alone. And then I realized I'm not alone. And that's a really powerful thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, the pushback is sort of funny, you should ask. So a couple of days ago, I think, I got an email from my institutional research board that someone made a claim that I posted personally identifying information in violation of my IRB. So when I do human subjects research, um, I have to keep in confidence anyone who participates in that research. Right. And so yeah. this person was saying that I violated it because I have the database. Hmm. So and of course the institutional review board said, just check in. Here's some questions. I re responded to their questions. They said, we don't need to investigate, right. but I do get that. I get, um, people uh, threatening to sue. I get lawyers occasionally contacting me. Um, but I'm not doing anything but aggregating public information. So Right. Yeah. It's all public records. So it's just kind of intimidation tactics, which we kind of get, you know, uh, but it is incredibly important to have because just as you said, this idea that, um, you know, folks feeling alone and then realizing how, how, um, but all the people moving institutions are moving abroad or moving in cities where, um, 
you know, they, they think that maybe this behavior is a new uh, uh, ground for them to mm-hmm. kind of still perpetuate these kind of abuses of power and that this... I think it's also... So I view it as, a, as an open science resource as well. So people can now use it to ask and answer fundamental questions about what is the nature of the misconduct that's occurring? Um, how much of the misconduct is actually public? So my estimate is the database is only about 5% of the cases mm-hmm. in the US that are resolved with a finding of sexual misconduct. Um, because most of the cases are resolved in cryptic or hidden ways, which is a big problem, right? Absolutely. That's a really good thing to note is that these are only the ones where there were actionable or where they found um, that there were findings and, and um, it, it resulted in, a, in some kind of disciplinary action. Would that be fair to say? Um, so no, <laughs> only sometimes, right? So they're evidence and the evidence can be a court finding a settlement, so if a university or a person settles for money, um, it could be a criminal conviction, it can be an institutional finding, or sometimes the person resigns or retires in the middle of an investigation, Mm -hmm. and then the university says, you don't work for us anymore, we don't have to investigate. And so those are included as well. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, I hadn't considered that. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, we know that those who report, or um, in general, the number of people who make, you know, claim very few are found to be substantiated. Um, so, um, w- with that being said, I guess um, wondering what this is for you. What about? I mean, the the amount of energy and personal labor and the emotional labor that you have to do searching these and keeping them up. I mean. Yeah. Wondering about the personal toll for you in doing so as a survivor. So I have to read some pretty awful stuff um, because I, I have to make sure that the cases truly belong in the database, right? Um, I can't, uh, I, 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 I need to make sure that the details are accurate. Um, and so it is a toll. And there have been a few times, like I take breaks. So I try to search every day. Um, but, but there was a period of time not that long ago where I had to take two weeks off. I just could not handle the cases anymore. And also some reporters seem to enjoy providing a lot of gruesome details that are honestly, I think, um, a power play of their own and are not necessarily the best thing to do for victim survivors, right? I, yeah. um, so, so some of the things I have to read are absolutely awful. The other emotional toll is, um, responding to people who say I was assaulted and, or I was harassed and this is what happened to me. Can you help? I, I can only help a little, I can't help a lot. Um, mm-hmm. and then, and then, um, there are a few people who, who send me emails. So, um, one of the most heartbreaking was the child of one of the people in the database asking me to remove their parents' name from the database because their parent couldn't get a job. Wow, yeah. This, this is something to, um, this sort of very human aspect of, and many people wonder, why don't people report or why don't they come forward? And these are things that also survivors think about is if they have a family, the family might hate me or what are they going to think? Anybody who knows them. Yeah, so that must have been the, those sorts of rush which we which aren't often focused on, like you said, the gruesome details or lawsuits and these kind of big headlines, and it very um, really overlooks the personal toll, not just on the survivor, the victim, but also those involved, like like this in this work that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. and the work that you're doing. Well, I, 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 when you were saying people coming forward, because we have a lot of you know people in the field that come forward, and man, it, it's very the. the all those feelings and emotions, it's not like, you know, perfunctory work and just say, okay, yeah, this, it's really, I mean, you, um, it, it, it's that emotional labor. Yeah, it's, it's very, very important, but it, it is very taxing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the frustration as well when you see how, first of all, what happened and then that, how it's handled. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, this is um, really something to, to be said. is And usually done on the backs of individuals who are unfunded or they do this on their own accord. <laughs> 
which is um, a whole other kind of a, that's a whole other field of stories. Um, but but right. you're not so your your um, activism and your work is is quite you branch out into quite. I mean, you we were just telling me earlier about. I would call it. Mm -hmm. I would call it advocacy, not activism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, your your advocacy yeah, is oh that's absolutely good. that's a good distinction to make. Yeah. Um, but you were telling earlier about this kind of culture where alcohol runs free in conferences and this this new initiative. So maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, I was at um, the Geological Site of America meeting. It must have been last year, and um, you know, yet again there were people who were um, being harassed, etc. Not, not now. Geological Society of America has done a wonderful job with their RISE program trying to really call out um, these behaviors that are limiting the access and the inclusion of everyone in the, the, that space. Okay, so let's mm -hmm. say that. Mm -hmm. Yet still, because um, alcohol is such a part of the geosciences culture, um, there are, you know, poster sessions that are like, hey, seds and suds, let's, you know, drink your beer and come to a poster. Or um, there's lots of alcohol available on the last day of the conference so that people that last day will come and stay that last day, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and there's a, a happy hour that happens. People get free beer. Right. And I can tell you, so I've been in this field for, my first GSA was probably 25 years ago, and I don't remember when it changed, but when I was first starting, you would get a, a drink ticket when you registered for every day of the conference, and it was for a beer, mm -hmm. and if you wanted a soda, you had to pay for it, Okay. and that has changed, so now you can have a soda with your drink ticket, um, because I... I can drink some, but I'm not going to drink in a professional setting. Right. Um, I just got comfortable with it. Um, and so anyway, at GSA, I, um, I was invited to join the Diversity in the Geosciences Committee. And I brought up at the meeting that we should perhaps do something about alcohol. It shouldn't be there for people to get spilled on or mm -hmm. leered at. It lowers inhibitions. Right. There are plenty of people who are recovering alcoholics, um, have religious objections, have families where alcohol was a problem or not something that they're comfortable with. And so it's not inclusive mm -hmm. to have it in the professional spaces where the person who's presenting and the person who is hearing that or reading that presentation has to be there, right? Right. So anyway, we wrote a proposal. Um, I drafted something and then my colleagues um, wrote a whole bunch of wet, fabulous changes the committee approved it, we sent it to the council, and the council just approved it. So alcohol is no longer allowed at posters and oral presentations. Yeah, we and this is such, as you said, it's such very often the fuel where inhibitions lower and then people mm -hmm. start kind of um, getting overly familiar and, but it's part of the culture, right? Even mm -hmm. just this sort of, you know, having a glass of scotch and, um, you know, um, I'm thinking of anthropology, I'm an anthropologist, and yeah, so this yeah. idea where you're there with the big boys kind of, and you're telling your, your fieldwork stories and, um, and how um, uninclusive this practice is. And also if you reject that offer for a drink or such. And, and actually, like, I would love to say no alcohol at the conference at all, but I don't think people could, would, would buy into that. Um, and it's, it's only limiting alcohol in the professional space. So there's alcohol in the exhibition hall. If you want to go buy some jewelry from an exhibitor and get a beer, I think you can. Like, that's not what we ask for. Right. It's just, if you want to be there for the content, the share of information and the networking, right. you can do that without alcohol. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, what what we often see is um, after conferences, there is this kind of partying, they call it networking, but it's very often in a bar in the hotel, or it's very often in this kind of, um, you know, there, there's liberal alcohol and, and other behaviors. And we often see that this is where a lot of sexual harassment or sexual assault plays, people's inhibitions there, they feel like they're on a vacation of sorts. And, um, and so this is very fused into the culture. Um, and so um, I, even, imagining that at even, you know, thinking it's 2020 and this is something that's still happening. So yeah, this is something to, to consider more widespread and hopefully yeah. 
um, having a widespread, and also when you're there as an uh, as a early career academic and you really want to be taken seriously, and then you're kind of sort of in the area where people are coming up and they're drinking and you can smell the alcohol in their breath and they're having these kind of non-professional conversations and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm thinking about um, just it, as far as the, the, the database, I believe it's moved its home. Is that right? You've, you've got a new home for the database. Where can folks yes. find that and how, and can they help or what can people do? Maybe, um, I know it's a, you're the sole, you know, manning the, the, the database, but how can folks um, access it now? So, yeah. So a couple of things, if, if you know of cases that are public, Mm -hmm. You can say there's a, there's a website or a, an email that you can email any suggestions to. I have had quite a few people send me documents as evidence of something, but I can't review documents because that then makes me liable right. for anything in that document that's not, and I, and I have to avoid that liability, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's one. The other is um, I, I do this um, for free and my... Um, uh, the programmers actually volunteered. They contacted me and they created this Drupal database for free. Mm -hmm. They just did it as a volunteer effort. Um, not, I'm not asking for money. I don't need money. Um, but, but what I would be interested in is if anybody um, knew of a small a place where I could get money. I'm used to getting funding from the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. But that's about STEM, right? And this right. is a database that crosses all disciplines. Um, Anyway, if anybody had any idea about funding, um, that would be great. My favorite thing is lots of people are using the data to write papers. Right. And if you write a paper, if you give a presentation, let me know and I'll stick it up on our publication space. It's not our publications, it's publications out of the data. Um, and that makes me feel giddy because I love data. <laughs> You've, you've mentioned that to me before. I know you're a big fan of data, but okay. So we can say the first thing is, of course, the, this type of, this is the difficulty with this type of work. It's very often unfunded, even though it is so important and it's really protecting um, people in science or just people in general. And yet it's the least, it's the lowest priority for funding bodies. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Funding is essential. Um, right when I finish this, I'm going to start scouring the documents but of what folks know as well and, and how important this is. Um, and, and I think also, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for you, but as a whistleblower, it can be very lonely. I can be very, this feeling sometimes that you're persona non grata and um, general support in any sense when you have a foundation or a larger funding body supporting you um, really helps to kind of um, substantiate that work and, and such. So no, it's not just about the money, but it's about the idea that this is important and it should be important and it should be fundable. And I, I pay um, undergraduates. I have some undergraduates who help code the data. So one of the things we want to do, um, so you, I think you'll love this. Um, we, I'm really curious about the question. Well, so two things. One, there's a woman, uh, Shtina Eckert, who's at Wayne State, and she's a communications scholar and um, gender studies or feminism. And um, we've, we've done some work together. Um, she actually won an award for one of the papers on how the stories were broken. So it turns out that like student newspapers, that's the place where you find out this information. The oh, big boy. national chains are not, or newspapers are not reporting on the, the smaller cases that are so prevalent. Right. Um, University of Georgia. Oh my God, that student paper is like my favorite paper. Um, and then um, the, the other thing is, um, I don't remember what I was going to tell you. That's okay, but I wanted to say that this is this triggered me to remember something because oh. um, I was thinking the that exact fact is that we very often only run across the Harvards, the Stanfords, the Ivy League, the Cambridge, and those are of course very important, right? There, the, you know, it's not to to um, you know minimize the importance of those cases. Um, anywhere there's you know every case is equally important when somebody's been impacted, yeah. but we very very rarely hear about what would be regarded as you know non headline grabbers. Even in community colleges, we know we have predators working. You know, you know, uses of power happen, um, but that's not as media kind of um, runnable. And so that this is why it's like an open data, data system when you have where people can just see any kind of a right. case that it's not necessarily there's no hierarchy within it. Um, but yeah. did you you had a I remember a that you want yes. to make? No, I think you'll love this part. So I have the question. I'm really curious. 
what happens to the assumed harassers, right? Mm -hmm. What yeah. happens after a finding, after a court settlement? Right. What happens to them? Mm -hmm. So we started tracking, and this is what I, I pay some undergraduates to do. We started tracking what happens to their careers. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating to me is some of them, particularly people who go to jail, okay, mm -hmm. or if they resign or retire, their career ends. But for many, many people for which there is evidence sexual harassment, right. and all sexual harassment is not okay. Mm -hmm. um, their careers not only don't suffer, but yeah. they go on to, for example, have a building named after them by the institution that paid out money for their to their harass to the person they yeah. harassed. Yeah. Like to me, because you know people want to say, "Oh, take them to court." Oh, that's the other thing is if you track the cases, it takes like ten years. Mm -hmm. from initiation to a finding or a settlement right yeah take them to court right so right. i just find that fascinating and that's a piece of research that we're doing now is what happens to the harasser mm -hmm. i would love to figure out what happens to the victim survivor but often we don't know who they are which right should be. yeah but this is such an important thing to know first i mean i'm appalled but also at the at, same time not surprised but that um this is a fear that survivors have is when they come out and say this happened to me they're going to be that name oh you were the victim of this or you made that accusation the idea that they're going to be sort of as they move through in their career yeah. you know we've a lot of survivors said people kind of treat me different like maybe they yeah. think i made it up even if they say they believe me like oh i might turn and make up something about them and they don't realize obviously this did happen to me right. if you don't do that behavior you have nothing to worry about but that that sort that they bear the burden of having this right. sort of branding and yet of, and yet um this prestige that doesn't seem to be tarnished by the the harasser yeah. um at all and mm -hmm. also that this is something this is a cultural problem it's not about any anyone individual yes. um and also i want to make just the comment and i'm sure you can speak to this is pe any people doubting the, the database that this i mean it has it by nature of it being found by the university, you know how many things they go or whatever organization, it has to be pretty substantiated and very, yeah. it's very well critiqued and very, you know, nitpicked with a fine tooth comb. So yeah. by nature of them, of there being some, some kind of an outcome, we know that this was substantiated for sure. Um, yes. And yet, yeah, we hear words like witch hunt and things like this that really make us wonder so um i'm looking for some grant funding because like i feel like the programmers need to get paid and one thing i want to do is um update the database to include sort of what leadership positions does the person hold or have they held what awards have they had um talk to year and so you can see what positions they've had before the the finding and what positions after and um, there's so um for instance, someone might be named um, a special fellow or something of a professional society. Mm -hmm. and, and some societies have no tolerance policies. And so the question then becomes, if they were made a fellow 15 years ago, and then there's a sexual harassment finding now, mm -hmm. um, does the society remove that fellowship? And I, I don't believe in a one-size-fits-all. And I, and I should say, I don't view the database as like a naming Thing. Like, I'm not naming people. Mm -hmm. There are names in there, but that's so people can track right. what happened to them before and what happened to them after. And, you know, what is the news media doing? That's the kind of research people are doing. Mm -hmm. It has the added benefit of allowing people to look someone up. But just because someone's not in the database doesn't mean um, that they haven't engaged in that behavior, right? It's, it's, right. it's very few cases that get in there. The other thing, I, you mentioned something um, that I wanted to, to just touch on, which is about um, people being afraid, like victim survivors feel like somehow they're stained if they report it, right? Mm -hmm. So through my own experiences reporting uh, sexual misconduct, what I found is that some people, not, not all people, but some people viewed me as the problem Yeah, because I reported it and my reporting 
this behavior, this bad, this behavior on the part of someone else, mm -hmm. that my reporting was the problem, yeah. not their behavior. Right. Um, and I, and I know that that's true. I know from my, you know, reading of research and sexual trauma, I know that that blaming of the victim for being, for rocking the boat happens. Mm -hmm. I was just really surprised right. that I got that reaction. I, I was a full professor when I reported. Right. Come on. Um, absolutely. And it yeah. still didn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I can second that with my own experience is that um, you mention it and then they're kind of giving you this little patch where they oh, be looking to it. And then if you bring it up, they're like, God, stop talking. Or like, you know, if you follow through, you become the problem student. Um, and you kind of are branded with this sort of like you are a maker or you're absolutely push and you know it's it's yeah. very bizarre but it, that's what I was saying it can be very lonely to be a whistleblower and it can be you it really is um, something that there's a huge emotional toll and mm -hmm. oddly enough people believe like oh if you report suddenly the clouds part and everything becomes fine and all this and there's really no help you know if if the, those who you report to don't take it seriously. Um, you either have to let it go or you have to renegade forward. And then when you do that, that personal risk that you pose for yourself, it's a mess. But in general, just that thing you get where you're kind of no longer as you once were, like you're out of the good graces of yeah. those relationships or in the university because you kind of expose this underbelly that they're like, don't go there, right? And, right. and it's um, such a larger implication. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I would I would definitely, I, I'm I, right, you know, D doubling what you just said yeah. is just in my own experience. Um, but doing this work that you do, I mean, have you felt at times that you were um, sort of, was people often think that, oh, you're shaming them, you have something to do, right? They, there's a lot of this sort of moral mm -hmm. policing uh, just when you stand up for victims. And what's maybe been your experience with that? So um, I think, again, because it feels titillating, I have had a reporter or two talk about naming and shaming, and that is not the database. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point right. is to evidence, because I'm a scientist, I want to evidence, I, I wanted to know, is there evidence for or against this being something common? Because I've experienced it, and almost mm -hmm. every woman I have talked to mm -hmm. has experienced harassment or assault. I mean, that is a truism across right. at least American society, and I would argue across most society, right? Right, right. And not necessarily at work, but in general in life. And a lot of people in my, in, in my discipline, certainly, a lot of women. And, and men, too, right? Of course. So um, the database is about evidencing. It's about not about naming and shaming. There are other things that people do. And I, I've had people ask me, so there was some student um, somewhere out west who started a, a spreadsheet where people were just naming assaulters on their campus mm -hmm. at a group of schools. And I was asked by a reporter about that. And I'm like, I don't, that's not what I do, right? That's, that's hearsay. And I think mm -hmm. that that's dangerous, both legally, but also you have no way of knowing, right. of evidencing the validity of that claim, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so I will say I haven't had pushback from institutions yet. Yeah. Um, we'll see, but I haven't had that. So, um, it, again, it lends itself to this idea that this is a very scorned woman and she's just mad and she's going to make this false claim. Oh, this really is alive and well in people's minds. And so this is, um, this is what the first, oftentimes the first thing people think, right? This is why this idea, like, I believe her became, you know, mm -hmm. was trending. Um, mm -hmm. Because, yeah, that this is somehow, you know, unsubstantiated and this is all just rumors. And, oh, but there was another woman who said he was a good professor. So, see, this mm -hmm. can't be true. You know, all these ridiculous, right. very silly things. Right. But yet here we, we see them, that they're, um, you know, that they're out there and being used against victims and in general in people's minds. Um, so yeah, definitely not necessarily about shaming, but as a student, I want to know what, you know, yes. who to, to protect myself or just in general, people want to know or need to know um, just for their own um, protection. Because we, we often see, I mean, maybe I can ask you that the rate of individual of having multiple gates, not just it being a one-time incident. What has been your experience with that data? I know you love data. Yeah. So in the database, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but I've done the right. calculation. Mm -hmm. The problem is the cases keep changing, mm -hmm. right? So I do it one week and then I have to do it again. And in fact, that's something I would love to automate mm -hmm. is to have programs so people could just create graphs. 
right there. Mm -hmm. um, again, these are the cases that make it into the news or make it through a formal process at a university. Right. So in the U.S., I've looked at with some colleagues of uh, like 30 uh, institutional sexual harassment policies, and all of the universities so far have informal processes that mm -hmm. one can go through when they make a complaint. And the informal process essentially doesn't exist, right? It happens, but it never triggers any sort of paperwork or stamp or report out so that uh, some of them even say it won't go in your personnel file. So you can have a informal finding and a sanction, but it doesn't actually exist anywhere for me to find, right? right? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of cases are like right. that. Right. Um, and so um, I, I think that the, the database allows, certainly for you to, to check mm -hmm. if someone has done something. Oh, so you asked me about number of people, sorry. Mm -hmm. So in the database, because it's the, the, big, the bigger cases, there are um, many people, more than half the people in the database have more than one victim mm -hmm. and, or victim survivor, and many of them have dozens. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we've coded all of that. That data is not in the database at the moment because I need the data programmers to code that in. Right. Right. Well, that's I'm very much like you. I know at Fieldwork Initiative, I'm always, I'm generally, it's like so much to be done, but I don't feel comfortable paying people for doing labor and volunteers are like, we're one to volunteer. I'm like, I just, just morally, I just, I, someone yes. does some work, they should be paid for it. And the same goes for you, this work that you've done. And so we're, you, we're empowered now to find some funding for this project because it's so important. Even if we have to crowdfund something three months from now from this airing, we want to no. have this project <laughs> funded. I want to see, you know, some foundation that's all about equity, gender equity, right. say, sure. And it's not just women who no. are harassed and it's not just men who are the harassers, no. but the numbers show mm. that it's in the 90s of the harassers are men and in the 90s of the victim survivors are women. Yeah, of or course, because it's about power, right? And we know patriarchy reigns. Um, this is power-based, absolutely. Let's be clear, it's not about sex. Right, absolutely. Wonderful. So, so um, as our sort of maybe summary of the things moving forward and putting <laughs> verbs, finding that funding, and then also having folks, um, you stated people reaching out to you um, regarding their knowledge of, of um, tracking. Maybe you can give us one statement of oh. that call, that verbal call. And then yeah. We can, mm -hmm. So you can reach out to the database if you know of a public case. So mm -hmm. can't be you have the paperwork and it's not published anywhere. Right. Uh, either there's a court case, and it, and it is actually quite hard for me as I'm not a lawyer, right, to search court cases. It's tricky. I have a bunch in there, but that's a hard one. So if there's a court case where it's public and evidenced in some way, um, that works. Or if you can get, so in the California system, reporters did an open records request, and they posted all of the sexual misconduct cases at a certain set of universities. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was the University of California system. And so since they posted all those records, I could put them in the database. Right, right. So if you know of a publicly accessible document mm -hmm. um, that, that I don't have, that I haven't accessed, you can send that information to me. Excellent. Yeah, that's very important to have as it, yeah. you know, as yeah. accurate. And then, of course, that labor that you do, that we just really appreciate so much this um, work that you do and how important it is. And so um, thank you as well for being here with us and, um, and speaking about this very important initiative and letting folks know, um, you know, as we move forward, that we start to continue to track those um, careers. And, and yeah. this is such important data, as you say. This is important yeah. to know as far as, um, dismantling the culture, looking deeply about what is actually at play and what happens, um, yeah. and just in general having a better understanding because it's such a taboo topic. There's such little known. As you said, somebody can move to, you know, um, Pennsylvania from you know, Alaska, and then they just create a new sort of a career. And so it, it's it's very important to have these threads. So. Thank you so much for being here, um, Dr. You. Barkin. Um, you can access um, Dr. Lebarkin's uh, database underneath here. We'll have a link posted. You can also find it on our resources page, um, as long as, as um, contact information. Um, and again, we are um, very motivated now to make sure that this. We're going to leave no stone unturned to make sure this work goes 
funded. And for anyone watching, um, the importance of, of um, not just citing survivors, but funding survivors' work and this work is so rarely something that is um, picked up, even though we know the work is so important. And so we just, we're going to send out our little veins out and, and bring back something productive. So thank you again, you and your sloth friend. This is the first thank time we've had a sloth yes. on our show. Isn't he adorable? Or, I know. We love it. We're always like, yes, a sloth. Cool. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm, go ahead. As soon as COVID is over, mm -hmm. we would like to visit Costa Rica mm -hmm. and see sloths in the wild. Are you a sloth? Uh, this is now the, the private part of the interview, the more personal part. Are you a, a sloth aficionado or where does that come from? They're just adorable and sweet. We have a book. There's a sloth hospital in Costa Rica. You don't touch the sloths. That's bad for them. And we have a book that's um, the little book of sloth. And it's just a wonderful, um, sweet story. And yes, we like the sloths. <laughs> I've heard that sloths were championing social distancing before it was even cool. So oh. they're, they're. And also um, they poop down poles. Kind of cool. They're, well, they, they're very <laughs> unique. I know. So that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> you should check them out. They're very interesting animals. Absolutely. This is a wonderful sl plug for sloths as well. But yeah, that's so you, that you're going to Costa Rica, you're going to see, take that vacation, take that time. It's so important. Self care in this work is, is very Someday. rare and important. So, Someday um, yeah. On vacation. And I actually would say I had not been on a vacation until a few years ago, not really. Hmm. And your emotional well being, your physical well being is so much yeah. more important than your job. Um, I just want to put that plug out there. I wish someone had suggested to me that I do something for myself much earlier in my life. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's a wonderful kind of a, a sentiment to lend, end us with because, yeah, I, I um, the, the toll that we kind of undertake in this work in general, and this work is so emotional, and, so, and when I say work, I mean issues for surrounding harassment and, and sexual assault or in general, any kind of discrimination. But just in academia, there's it's such a toll. And so, yes, self-care. Um, is very important. So thank you so much for that that reminder. Um, okay. Once again, we're, we thank you for being with us and we are um, going to be following up with this project as it's ongoing, looking for funding, looking for new stories. If we want to hear more about the situation, that will definitely happen. So thanks again. Thank you everyone for watching and listening with us. Um, again, you can access any of the resources Dr. Lebrakin spoke of underneath at our link or you can also visit our website. Please, you can access her website and get in contact with her there. So thank you.